So my family, when I was in high school, my family kind of became the family where everybody hung out. My parents um, began to be known as Mama June and Daddy Warren. Their names are June and Warren, which is really close to Jude and Warren Cleaver, but you might not know who that is. But, um, but anyway, so my parents, and they're here today. You can, you can call them Mama June and Daddy Warren. My dad now goes, he went by DW for a little while for Daddy Warren, and now it's just D-Dub. So D-Dub and Mama June are over there, and um, they'll be glad to talk to you. But um, that feeling of community, we often have 50 people for Thanksgiving dinner at my parents' house, and uh, we gather, and we, as the evening goes on, as the celebration goes on, we kind of disperse to different places around their, their property there. Some people go off and ride four-wheelers. Some people go shoot pool in the billiard room. And then there's my people, the front, the front porch people. And um, we sit on the front porch at my parents' house on Thanksgiving, and we solve every problem the world has ever had, every one of them right then. We also uncover any and all government conspiracies um, and that, that, that may be happening or soon to happen. And so as we sit out there at that, that joyous time each year, I, inevitably, I'll start getting questions. And one of the questions I've gotten the last two years, honestly, is it's a, it's a puzzling question. And it is this. Why does God seem so mean in the Old Testament and so loving in the New Testament? So, so as we open God's word today, my hope is that we will gain understanding, realizing that since God is unchangeable, the problem must be with how we study his word. Our scripture today is found in Leviticus 10, if you'd like to find your place. Theologians refer to to passages like this one we are about to read as the hard sayings, things that make one ask, how or why did or could God do this? Leviticus 10, verses 1 through 3 read, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. We read in Leviticus 9 of a high point for Israel. Things are, are great. The people are joyful. They feel close to God. The tabernacle had been completed. God's specific instruction for offering the various sacrifices, the instructions had been received, and they had been obeyed. The inaugural worship in the tabernacle would reach its climatic conclusion with God miraculously sending his own, his own fire to light the altar, consuming the offerings. The mood would have been one of great awe and celebration. But within the span of just one chapter of text, God's judgment had been earned and God's judgment had been executed. It seems like all the I's were dotted and all the T's were crossed and God had, with fire from himself, consumed the offerings. And then right here in chapter 10, we read that Nadab and Abihu did something outside the command of God. They offered strange fire or unauthorized fire, depending on your translation. They did something God had commanded them not to do. And what happened, verse 2 says very clearly, fire came out from the presence of God and consumed them. God earlier had consumed the offerings of Aaron on behalf of his obedient people. And now one chapter later, a fatal sin and God instead consumes Aaron's sons. And we're not sure what strange fire even means reading 
A little further to verse 9, it's, it's possible the men were drunk and that led to their lack of attention to detail or either way, there was a disregard for God's command. And perhaps the reason no specific action is listed is because God was judging the heart of these two men. They were either trying to improve on God's prescription or they were taking God's commands lightly. Moses had warned to follow God's commands. In Leviticus 8, at the doorway of the tent of meeting, moreover, you shall remain day and night for seven days and keep the charge of the Lord so that you will not die. For so I have been commanded. Nadab and Abihu did not heed the warning from Moses and they died. And to to our human flesh, this seems like a, like a hard punishment for a minor infraction. God says, I will be regarded as holy. You will worship me in spirit and in truth. And that brings us to our first point today. By the way, there's only going to be two points this morning, uh, not three. It does not mean you're getting done any earlier. They're both really long, so... I don't get to preach often. I've got a lot to say. Get comfortable. There, I like you too, Marky. Thank you. <laughs> Our first point this morning, God is holy and unchanging. Then Moses said to Aaron, it is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. God says, I will be treated as holy. That is an important word. He does not say, I hope to be treated as holy. But I will be treated as holy. When we, when we say God is holy, we must understand that sin is the opposite of God's will. God is perfection, sinless perfection. And that means he despises and hates sin. Because it is the opposite of him. When Isaiah hears the angels cry out in Isaiah 6, and one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. In English, we use exclamation points or bold type to emphasize a written word, whereas in Hebrew, repeating something three times elevates it to the superlative degree. God is not merely holy, He is holy, holy, holy. No other attribute of God is referred to with such emphasis throughout Scripture. 1 Samuel 2, There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Hosea 11, For I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst. Romans 7, So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. A.W. Tozer writes, We cannot grasp the true meaning of the divine holiness by thinking of someone very pure and then raising the concept to the highest degree we are capable of. God's holiness is not simply the best we know, infinitely bettered. We know nothing like the divine holiness. It stands apart, unique, unapproachable, incomprehensible, and unattainable. Nadab and Abihu did not just break the speed limit. They failed to treat God as holy, and God justly struck them dead. Unfortunately, many choose to preach a God of forgiveness and a God of grace, but not a God of holiness. We neglect God's holiness, his resulting intolerance of sin, and his inevitable wrath. His demand to be worshipped and honored correctly. And the sad part of this omission is that only those who understand their propensity for sin, only those who understand their worthiness of God's wrath, only those will live freely within God's grace. We often forget that. 
what we deserve. On a side note here, I am so grateful for the elders, pastors, teachers that God's put around us here at Capshaw. Daryl Harrison says, a primary reason many profession Christians today are offended by the doctrine of hell is that they are not actually gospel-centered Christians, but in reality are merely theistic amorous who are in love with God's love, but not with his holiness. Much has changed since the early days of the tabernacle, but the one thing that has not changed is the character of God. Hebrews 13 reads, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as we sit here this morning, God is every bit as jealous for his name and his glory as he ever has been. He does not negotiate or diminish his command to be treated as holy. And this is why when we read of Jesus in the garden, the garden of Gethsemane, right? He is in, he's in prayerful agony. He begins to sweat blood. He prays, God, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. He's not fearing the pain of the crucifixion. He's not, he's not afraid of how much flesh the scourging will remove. What terrifies him is that he will soon stand before a holy God. And he'll be judged not by his own works, for they were perfect. But he will be judged by our works, our sins. He knows more than any human is capable of knowing the extent of God's holiness. He knows more than any human is capable of knowing God's hatred for sin and his divine wrath. Shortly, Christ would satisfy God's wrath. For every saved sinner, past, present, and future, this thought caused his blood pressure to rise violently. His blood vessels dilated until his capillaries ruptured, spilling his blood, foreshadowing his blood to be shed for the sins of humanity. But our flesh tells us, I don't deserve God's wrath because I'm a good person. I pay my taxes. I teach a small group. I'm a deacon. I'm an elder. I lead a women's ministry. I'm a good parent. I'm a good spouse. I'm a pastor. I tried to get everybody there. I think I did. But Isaiah 64 brings us right back to reality. For all of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind take us away. Church, I do not have the time nor the courage to go into what filthy garments actually are. But they are filthy. And that's our works and deeds compared to the holiness of God. We see... Throughout the word of the New and Old Testament, we see examples of strict judgment for an important moment. Just as the first worship in the New Tabernacle, God had given strict directives for worship. What if God had allowed his early priests to just worship any way they wanted? This would have set a pattern for disobedience. Disrespect for generations to come. God's response is swift and terrifying in order that a divine mandate for worship pleasing to a holy God would be clearly and eternally proclaimed. God also conveys the peril of worship outside of his design. Though we do not burst into flames in this current church age, God remains every bit as holy as he ever Has been. In other words, our actions in false worship are just as worthy of wrath as the actions of Nadab and Abihu. In Acts 5, we read of Ananias and Sapphira. Pastor John tackled that scripture for us, but as Christ's early New Testament church is growing, the faithful, they're selling their possessions and they're giving cheerfully and proclaiming 
the good news. But Ananias and Sapphira, they decide to covertly keep back a little for themselves. They dishonor a holy God. And what does God do? The word of God reads, Acts 5. Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard of it. The young men got up and covered him. And after carrying him out, they buried him. And a similar fate was awaiting Sapphira. Instant death for not having an appropriate fear and respect of God. Why would anyone lie to God if they truly knew of his holiness? In the first days of tabernacle worship, God kills Nadab and Abihu for their sins against him. In the first days of the Christian church, God kills Ananias and Sapphira for their sin against him. God is unchanging. When scripture repeats, we are to listen. Inaugural worship within both Old and New Testament covenant gatherings was marred by humanity's sin and God's wrath. God makes a dramatic statement when he commissions an age of worship. He says, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And this should bring us to fear and to celebration. Charles Spurgeon says, I believe the holier a man becomes, the more he mourns over the unholiness which remains in him. But we like to think that the judgment of God is not fair or it's too severe. And we've all said it, and that statement reflects our arrogance, that we're not aware of the depth and the seriousness of our own sin. Why couldn't God just give them a pass? Why couldn't God just go easy on them? We as fleshly people often suffer from what I refer to as a grace entitlement mindset. Grace entitlement. I think of a story I once heard a seminary professor tell. The school year had begun and the professor had a new class of freshmen. The professor makes it clear, freshman, you have three papers due throughout the term, equally spaced. Don't panic about it. Just turn your work in on time. The penalty for not turning your work on time is an F. So the first due date comes. It's the day the papers are due. And in a class of 150, about 138 have their assignment. And 12 students plead, please give us another chance. We're just, we're getting used to this whole college thing. This will never happen again. Please have mercy on us, professor. And the professor, stirred by their earnest plea, showed mercy. He said, okay, I'll make this one exception. You have until Monday. Do not let this happen again. And the students in one accord exclaimed, oh, it'll never, ever happen again. Thank you so much for not giving us an F. The second due date comes. It's the day the papers are due. In a class of 150, about 120 have their research papers. Oh, please, professor, understand it's midterm. We have so many assignments and tests. We just couldn't keep up with the massive workload of this seminary. Please have mercy on us. Please, please, please. This will never happen again. And the professor with a compassion few can imagine said, okay, you may turn in your paper late, but understand this will be the last time. And the students, of course, of course, this will never happen again. Thank you, professor. And then the end of the term comes. It's the day the papers are due. In a class of 150, Less than 100 have their research papers. A student presumptuously says, Hey, bro, sorry about that. I'll get it to you next week. Another student says, Yeah, I just have too much with the end of the school year going on right now. How does next week work for you? 
And the professor looked the student in the eye and said, F. He looked the next student in the eye and he said, F. And what happened? These grace entitled students screamed out, but that's not fair. And so the professor looks at the the student that had told him this isn't fair. And he said, your second paper was late, right? Mm Mm-hmm. F. And your first paper was late, right? Yeah. F. He looked at the class. He says, does anyone else desire justice? Does anyone else want fairness? And the professor goes on. He says, at that point, he had a classroom full of errands. Therefore, they kept silent. (laughs) But what was going on here is that as this professor was being more and more gracious, the students were becoming more and more ungrateful. By the time the failing grades had occurred, they felt entitled to grace. Time and time again in Scripture, we read of God delivering Israel from its enemies, only to later read the words, Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. The problem is not with God's judgment. The problem rests with our fleshly arrogance in feeling that we deserve anything other than God's wrath. R.C. Sproul writes, The history of the Old Testament is not the blood-curdling history of a tyrannical deity. It is the history of a stiff-necked people who always and everywhere take God's forbearing grace for granted and despise his holiness and have no fear of his judgment. I wish I could deliver that like Sproul does it. It sends chills down your spine. But We are no longer blown away by God's grace. We don't find God's grace astonishing. What, what shocks and amazes us is God's judgment. We choose to be amazed by God's just reaction when we receive it, while simultaneously demanding grace. And when we do not get it, we call that injustice. We must never forget that God's grace is not something we are entitled to, but it is a free and it is an unearned gift. Our second point this morning, the most serious crimes against God occur in corrupt worship. So how do we offer strange fire before the Lord? How do we corrupt our worship? To define strange fire, a simple definition, um, when we worship the Lord on our terms rather than his. Sproul says, nothing gives believers more joy than to see God glorified. And we hear that statement, we nod our heads and we say, that's right. But we must ask ourselves, is glorifying God really what brings us joy? Is that really where we seek fulfillment? Simply in the glory of God? Or have we said, as we all have, things like this, This particular church, they just don't have enough events for my liking. Or with the preaching, I don't get any practical advice from this pastor. He just talks about sin, grace, forgiveness, and Jesus. When's he going to do five keys to a better marriage? Or the worship team doesn't play my favorite songs, so I can't worship. I've never heard that here, by the way. That's other churches. Notice within our complaint, within our grumble, whether or not a church gathering is glorifying God is not even mentioned. Years ago, before I was in ministry, I chaperoned a youth camp. I was in my early 20s, so the teenagers weren't much younger than I. And as we were riding the bus to the the camp, I asked few of the teens, what are you excited about, about this coming week? What, you know, you guys are obviously very excited. What is it that you're excited about? And one of the girls said to me, we get to actually worship to the music. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, I can actually worship to that music. 
And I was confused. I knew her worship leader, and I knew the church um, where they attended, and, and they were a God-glorifying church in worship. So I asked, what was the problem? And she went on to say, the problem was is that their, their worship leader, he, they didn't play her favorite worship songs. And because of that, she could not worship. So we go to corporate worship at this, at this youth camp, right? We're at the corporate worship service and the, the music's being played and people are singing. But our group, our teens, they were very distracted. They're talking to each other during the, the music worship. And they're having a really good time, but they're not really engaged in glorifying God, right? And all of a sudden, the band begins to play their favorite song. And what do they do? They immediately shriek. And they run into the crowd at the center of the room and they raise their hands up above their head and they start singing at the top of their lungs. But see, God had not just changed and become worthy of worship. He was every bit as worthy of worship two minutes before. What had changed was that their worship preference had been satisfied. What was going on here was that this group was celebrating getting what they wanted. And we have to be very careful here. There is nothing, nothing, nothing wrong with having preferences. I have many. But our first preference must be to see God glorified. And on this, we must be united. Do we find ourselves saying things like, well, I just have to go to a very particular kind of church for worship. Or the preaching, the music, the community, the activities, they must be tailored to my preferences or I just won't get anything out of worship. And what we must understand is that worship is not about what we get out of it, but about giving God what he deserves. Calvin said, no worship has ever pleased God except that which looks to Christ. So we have to ask ourselves, do our preferences hinder the worship that God deserves? So how else do we offer strange fire today? When I got to this section, I, I thought of so many ways we fail that this section was so long it threw the whole thing out of balance. So I had to just choose... Um, Different, different ways that we bring strange fire before the Lord. But what about denying the ordained roles for men and women in our church? We look at a, a culture that seeks to cancel gender, a culture that seeks to cancel the traditional family, and we scoff at society's rejection of God's design. And then we turn around and do the same thing. I bring this up because our convention is dealing with this very thing right now. We attempt to cancel parts of God's word that we find unacceptable. God in his word clearly says to man and woman, these are your roles. Within God's design, women can do things that men cannot do. And men are assigned certain duties forbidden to women. God offers women many positions of service in his church, but reserves one area of service for qualified men. And the church sometimes tries to massage the word of God on this, looking for ways to sidestep. God. You know, did God really say that in his word? That's, that's not what he meant. He, he didn't really say what you think he says there. And we must remember when we engage in that line of thinking that this argument was first offered by a serpent in a garden. You can eat all of this fruit except for this one. And what do we say? Well, then I want that fruit. We witness gospel professing churches today defying the word of God. And then we have the nerve to be shocked when lost people defy the word of God. John 4 reads, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. If true worshipers worship in spirit and truth, that must mean all other worship is 
false. Rest assured, God knows the condition of our heart every time we approach him in worship. God demands honor consistent with his word. That is what it means to worship in truth. John Piper writes, Do you feel loved by God because you believe he makes much of you? Or because you believe he frees and empowers you to enjoy making much of him? Christ does not find his identity in us. We find our identity in him. And Capshaw, I shudder to think of the times I have failed. The times I have gone about my assigned duties in a way that was not primarily to glorify God. I've, I've planned worship services where the main attention was really stirring the congregation or making people feel good or every worship leader's dream, right? Getting those hands raised up in the air rather than focusing my attention on bringing glory to God. I have learned that God's glory is much better at stirring the believer and bringing the believer to joy than any human effort. John MacArthur writes, the highest duty and privilege, the most essential behavior and the supreme responsibility of humanity is to worship God. In church, there is a strange fire that has been infiltrating the church in recent years. At first it was called political correctness, and now it has morphed into a legalistic thought system known as wokeism. The idea is basically that the Holy Spirit is not doing enough to sanctify God's people. We must enact policy to make up for the lacking of the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you the number of disappointing sermons I've heard in recent years. Sermons that stress a new perspective and viewpoint on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faithful followers that for a year have proclaimed from the pulpit that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone are now pushing a faith plus works agenda geared to political and societal policy, policy change rather than heart change. The strange fire of wokeism finds allies and supporters amongst those who both deny and despise God. And in some areas, pleasing the mob has taken the place of pleasing the Father. John Flavel, the English Puritan, wrote, The worldly person fears man, not God. The strong Christian fears God, not man. And the weak Christian fears man too much and God too little. And unfortunately, real sin issues such as sexism, racial injustice, hatred... Within this belief system, they're not dealt with spiritually, but systematically. And we worry about how we will be perceived by others rather than being concerned over how we will glorify God in our actions. We would do well to remember Paul's words in Colossians 2. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the word, world rather than according to Christ. We live in a season of racial tension in our country. And humanity put us there. Humanity's sin put us there. I can assure you humanity's efforts are not the cure. They're not the answer. When we say the phrase, black lives matter today, everybody gets quiet. Like that. It puts everyone on edge, right? Everybody is afraid of how they'll be perceived or labeled when we really all agree. Of course, of course, black lives matter. Of God's creation, one of the natural revelations that I enjoy the most is God's love of variety. We are different people. We come from different cultures. We have different backgrounds. We have different amounts of melanin in our skin, yet we are all image bearers of God. And since 1973, 17 million black image bearers have been killed through abortion. 
reducing the black population in our country by as much as 25%, according to some. The U.S. government, elected by our society, gives $568.7 million a year to Planned Parenthood, an organization that was founded by a white supremacist, a lady that spoke at KKK rallies, and she referred to our black brothers and sisters as undesirables and weeds. But the same society that then screams Black Lives Matter, we then refer to the abortion of 17 million black babies as health care and reproductive rights. The Trojan horse of wokeness is the golden calf of this generation. Just like in Exodus 32, where the people convinced themselves they were worshiping the one true God, when what they were worshiping was their own human nature. We see this now with a false social gospel of works and groupthink. In Exodus, God punished the corrupt worshipers. There was massive slaughter. Brother rose against brother carrying out God's mandate for those who had committed crimes against God in worship. Friends, some of the scariest, most terrifying words in the Bible are found in Matthew 7. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice lawlessness. Does our, the version of ourself we put out to the world, like our, our social media, for instance, our, our Facebook, our TikTok, our Instagram, Snapchat, do they reflect an image bearer of God? Or do we seek to cause divisions via arguments or political stances? Are we living out the Great Commission? Or are we sexually dehumanizing ourselves, offering up foul content for the purpose of gaining followers and likes? Romans 12 reads, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The question we should ask this morning is not, why did this horrible thing happen to Nadab and Abihu? Or why did this thing happen to Ananias and Sapphira? The question we must ask is, why hasn't this happened to me? God has graciously spared us from his wrath. Capshaw, we desire to be a church that treasures Jesus that with Christ at the center of all we do together, we will become more Christ-like. And that as God shapes and sanctifies us, we will naturally desire to share the one true gospel across the street and across the world. Though we are flawed and destined to fall short, we must unite in the desire to worship a holy God in spirit and in truth. When we observe the depths of our failing, only then do we begin to see the beauty of God's amazing grace. We are given free will. We're not robots. We do know, though, that humanity's will is enslaved to sin. And because of that, when the fallen person makes a choice, he or she does, does so on the basis of a fallen nature. A fallen nature will make fallen decisions. The Holy Spirit works to open our eyes to our sin and our need of a rescuer. That rescuer is Jesus. In Jesus Christ, God gives us a Savior, a mediator. He gives us himself. 
The wrath that we deserve for our own strange fire has already and forever been satisfied. When God died on the cross, he paid the penalty for all of the sins of those he has called unto himself. Speaking of salvation, John Owen says that it's initiated by the Father, ratified by the Son, and communicated by the Spirit. The Father dispenses divine sovereign love. The Son dispenses divine sovereign grace. And the Holy Spirit dispenses divine sovereign life, securing our salvation. Our God is worthy of worship. And he deserves nothing less than worship in spirit and in truth. As our musicians come to the stage, I would like to close with a quote from Puritan writer Thomas Goodwin. Our worship is sometimes with the Father, then with the Son, and then with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes our hearts are drawn to consider the Father's love in choosing us. Sometimes to the love of Christ in redeeming us and sometimes to the Holy Spirit who searches the deep things of God and reveals them to us. Church, let's pray together. God, keep us ever mindful of our sin that we might fully cherish your saving grace. We as believers are no longer slaves to sin, but we have been freed to worship you. God, we are grateful for worship. Guide us to worship you rightfully and truthfully. God, I pray that if there is one here this morning that has never known you or has previously rejected you, that you will call them to yourself, that they may join our family of believers in treasuring Jesus, becoming more like him together and sharing his gospel. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.